um, I will be moderating for better or worse. Um, we have a great lineup of speakers, and we want to try and get a little more um, question interaction here. So we are hoping our speakers can keep their talks to 15 minutes and then have five minutes for questions. So 20 minutes total, I'll have little cards. I'll let you know when you have five minutes left of your 15 minute period, and then one minute um, you choose to go over it. But your own question and answering Carol. Um, so yeah, I'll be kind of keeping an eye on the time and try and keep us moving along. And with that, I will introduce our first speaker, uh, Lee Richardson. He is a USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture postdoctoral research fellow in the Gun Institute here at UVM. Um, his work focuses on interactions among species, in particular those involving bees, their parasites, and the plants they pollinate. He also studies the causes and consequences of these species and his talk is entitled The Decline of Bumblebee Species Diversity in Vermont 1900 to oh, 1915 to 2014. This is a little bit sorry, okay, thanks. Hi. Yeah, the title changed a little bit because when I wrote the abstract I wasn't accurate about the balance of the data set that we're talking about today. I have two co-authors on this, uh, Ken McFarland and Sarah Zahendra, who are both uh, employees of the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, and this is a VCE uh, uh, survey project. And there's Ken there. Um, so I'll be talking today about um, the bumblebees that are native to Vermont um, and what has happened in the last century of record keeping. So bumblebees are in this family called Apidae. They share that with the honeybees. And I want to be very clear at the outset that bumblebees are different from honeybees. I'm sure you all know that. Uh, but honeybees are an agricultural import from the old world. Very important bees, but usually they're, uh, they exist only in managed colonies on farms or in Indian areas, as opposed to these wild bees, which live largely without the, the aid of human beings um, in forests and wetlands and other types of habitats. Okay, so uh, there are only about 20 species in our area, but that's out of a total of 270 bee species in our area. So we actually have many more bee species in Vermont than most people would assume. Um, and many of them don't look like what you think a bee should look like. They're, they're small, uh, ant-like, winged creatures. Um, the reason to spend any time on this taxon, I think, is that they're very important uh, keystone species and ecosystems, and also very important to human agriculture. So one species here, visiting flowers of the cultivated blueberry and fireweed and wild plant, um, they, uh, bumblebees and other wild bees account for a large fraction of the pollination that happens on farms. Even though you might assume that uh, we have honeybees for that, it's usually wild bees that, that uh, commute into farms, and get their food and leave, and so doing pollinate. So um, if we're losing bees, it's an important, it has important consequences both for the environment and for the human food supply. So are we losing bees? As you probably know, we are, or we think we are, uh, but the, the evidence is uh, of varying quality. Okay, so there are widespread reports of bumblebee declines and declines of some other species, but not others. And of course, there are super widespread uh, uh, reports of declines of honeybees. This is a different story than that one. Um, this is one paper that shows fairly convincingly that bumblebees are declining over time, and all you need to look at is this trend line over about a century or more showing diversity declining over time. Um, and this species here is the poster child for bumblebee uh, uh, rarity at present, at least here. This is Bombus affinis, uh, the rusty belted bumblebee. It's a candidate for listing as threatened or endangered with the federal ESA statute. It's already protected in Canada under the analogous statute, and it's protected here in Vermont and some other states and provinces. Okay. So, uh, oops. so one of the problems here is that we, we lack good data from uh, historic time periods for thinking about how common or rare bees were. So it can be difficult to figure out, uh, we can survey them now, but it can be difficult to figure out how things have changed if at all. And so in comes citizen science. Uh, we decided that we would, uh, at Vermont Center for Eco Studies, collect as much of the historic data as we could, and then do new surveys and look at changes <coughs> the relative abundance of the various species in the two data sets, and then use various types of landscape analysis to uh, assess where bees are found and where they're not found now. Okay, so by historic, I mean collections up to 1999. By modern, I'm going to mean everything after that in this survey up to 2014. Uh, for the modern collections, we have lots of casual collections and also photographs. So if somebody was in their backyard, they collected a bee, sent it to us, that's a record. Um, we also have standardized roadside surveys where the individual drove this 
route and collect it in a, in a standardized method that we can repeat in five years, 10 years, 50 years, possibly from now. Okay, so this is what museum specimens look like before they become data. This is what the survey looks like. And this is Bob's terricola. One of the bees that I'm going to show you has become rare. So here's the data for the historic data set. Uh, we collected a total of 1,669 records. About a third to a half of these come from the UVM collections, the Zadok Thompson Zoological Collections. Uh, there's a sizable fraction from the Middlebury College collections, Invertebrate Zoology, uh, Linden State College, the American Museum of Natural History. So these are all dead bees on pans in museum drawers, collecting dust, occasionally being used for educational purposes. Um, and then uh, in the modern period, we collected another 10,650 bees, mostly specimens on pins, also some photographs. And um, so now I'm going to tell you about comparisons between these two data sets. And I hope you can just make the vis visual comparison and see at least one difference between the two data sets besides the size. Um, to me, it's, it's the, uh, the, the warming of points around Chittenden County in the historic data set. So more about that in a minute. Um, so the first thing I did was compare the relative abundance of bees in the historic data set to the relative abundance of the same species in the modern data set. Okay, so relative abundance is the number of individuals of one species divided by all of the, the number of all individuals in the data set. So for example, this one in patients, Bombus of patients, made up about 25% of the historic data and now makes up about 23% of the modern data. And what you can see here is anywhere that a blue bar is higher than an orange bar, we have a decline, at least by this measure. And the converse, we have an increase. So certain species like this one, Bombus fervidus, Aphanus, Terricola, these three have all declined sharply between those two time periods, um, from something like 10 to 15 percent of all collections down to less than 1 percent in some cases. By contrast, this one, Vagans, has increased greatly in relative abundance. The dark, uh, the bold names and the stars indicates that they have uh, disappeared altogether from the state, as far as we can tell. So we did have 18 total species. We now are down to about 12. 12. And that's a loss of nearly 30% of the species. We also have numerous other species that have declined in relative abundance, but still persist. So we've lost uh, something like 50% of those species have declined or disappeared just since uh, the year 2000. Okay, so this is another way to look at the, the same data set I just showed you. This is the relative, the change in relative abundance. So across the x-axis we have uh, the change, either negative or positive, in relative abundance. It's just subtracting the orange bar from the blue bar in the previous slide. And I did this so that we can easily see who has declined and who has increased. Okay, so again, the star names are species that are now gone, we think. Uh, but there are others here that have declined quite a bit. So this one called Fervidus, you'll hear more about in a minute. Uh, this one called Terricola, you'll hear more about in a minute. Uh, by contrast, we have some very common species now, at least by this measure, this relative abundance measure. Okay? So beyond that, we wanted to see how does the landscape affect where bees are and where they aren't. So we use data sets like this, uh, this PRISM annual precipitation data, uh, the land cover land use data that I, I know a lot of you are very familiar with. This is St. Johnsbury. Imagine uh, are bees more likely to occur in downtown St. Jay in the red areas which are developed as opposed to out of Danville where there's a mix of farmland and, um, and forests of different types. Um, we also looked at elevation, precipitation, uh, other types of precipitation data, um, and I'll, I'll show you some of the results from that. So first of all, Oh, and, and roads. So first of all, about roads, uh, we uh, constructed these rasters of road density um, and then figured out for each point, these are actually long week collection points in the town, um, what's the density of road or the length of roads within a 500 meter and a 1,000 meter or 1 kilometer buffer around that point. Um, with the idea that roads are a good proxy for lots of other things about people like housing, um, uh, impervious surfaces, uh, house pads, and so on. Right? Um, and so all I want you to get out of this is to see that there is, these are simple, one way I know this with means and standard error, that there is a lot of difference among species in how tolerant they of, uh, are of human um, development. And I've put both the half kilometer and the one kilometer radiuses up here. 
you can see generally they, uh, they're correlated within a species, but there are some differences. So some species, like this one called Citrinus, is much more common near roads. Or when we find it, there are a lot more road segments in the, the buffer around it um, than this one, Sanders and I, where when we find it, um, there are far fewer roads in the area. Okay. Uh, we looked at land cover land use, and this is those same species that are extant, that are in the modern data set. And this is uh, what we, around the 500 meter buffer around each collection, uh, what are the cover types? And this is a lot of data. It's means and standard errors. I just want you to see gross patterns, okay? So uh, the ones at the top uh, tend to uh, be found with much more field and, and crop. So yellow is hay fields, grasslands, orange is crops. Uh, by contrast, the ones down here tend to be found in association with much more forest. So hardwoods mixed and just and, uh, evergreens. And um, so this is just to show you that there are differences in the state of where, where we find the different species. Um, and so that leads us to thinking about whether the modern data set is a good proxy spatially for the historic. And obviously it isn't just for a visual comparison. So we also subsampled the modern data, just pulling out only the points that occur near the historic data points within five kilometers of them. And I want to go back to this figure where I showed you which species have declined and which have increased. And now if we throw up the same data but from, the same comparison but only with the subset of data, uh, we see some differences. So this species which we would have thought was declining is actually increasing <coughs> in Vermont. Uh, and some of the ones that we thought increased the most have actually increased a little less than, um, than what we thought. And two pictures of winners and losers. Uh, that's a loser, while this fervidus, that's a grassland species, probably nests on the surface of the soil rather than underground and um, in hayfields. And this is Bombus vegans. It's a forest bee, it's a, it's a tolerant bee, it lives in lots of different places. Okay. So quickly, the standardized roadside surveys. Um, about 58% of this data was collected in these, in these um, uh, standardized uh, road uh, surveys. So each one of these little blobs is a series of points where we drove every kilometer we got out of the car and we caught bees for 10 minutes, and then we drove another kilometer. And at each point, we recorded the plants, the weather, um, and other aspects of uh, the survey. So we surveyed 64 in independent routes, about two times each, uh, almost 1,300 individual stations along all of those routes. And this is over three years, but I'm showing you two years of data. Um, this is Bombus ternarius, one of the common ones. So what we found, um, and this is, this is important because this is the data that we can repeat in the future. This is the survey that we can repeat indefinitely and get this, we can expect that we're holding everything else the same except changes in bee abundance and diversity. So we had about five bees per station, uh, 10 minute collection, almost two species per station. Um, uh, we had almost 20% of the stations no bees in a 10 minute time period. Uh, and we looked at which plants the bees were foraging on. Um, about a third of the stations, the, plant, the bees were only taken from native plants, and half of the stations only from weeds. And this is important because we're thinking about whether we're accurately sampling the whole landscape by just looking at roadsides. Are weeds considered that invasive? I, by that I mean non-native plants. Non -native. Yes, okay. sorry. Um, so here's a, uh, this is uh, Bombus griseocollis on a weed, a non-native plant, and Bombus ternarius on a native salvago. Okay, so uh, we also looked at the effects of, diverse, of uh, landscape metrics on diversity and abundance. So we have here Shannon's H diversity index, also simple richness or counts of species and abundance. And this is a lot of information, so just focus there. Um, these are, uh, so that the statistically significant effects have um, pluses and minuses over there. And uh, all I want you to see is that grasslands are important predictors of diversity, species richness, and abundance. Okay, and also that forests are significant predictors of abundance. Yeah. When you say grassland, you include like goldenrod fields, things like that? Yeah. Only um, so I should have said this, but I lumped uh, what is called a grassland with a hay field for this. So it's not, they're not native grasslands or 
know, a, a ecosystem that a natural community that perpetuates perpetuates itself. An old field, an old field all we're dealing with. Yeah, but sure. like a, a field called like goldenrod, it wouldn't just be all poaceae necessarily. No, no, it's uh, it's that that's in this. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a, okay, and so uh, I just wanted to also show that uh, elevation is important uh, for some of these measures, but um, not at, at, so. I also have this data for the one kilometer, but at the 500 meter elevation, it's not important. Well, yeah. How do we know what's diversity in abundance? Uh, sorry, so everything here is Shan's age diversity. Everything here is just the abundance, and everything here is richness. So for all three separate analyses, uh, grasslands are a significant predictor of, of these response variables. Okay, so some quick conclusions. Uh, Vermont has lost a large fraction of what is a key pollinator taxon, uh, the genus Bombus. Um, these declines are potentially linked to land use change, we know from other, other work. And um, so we actually have the data in Vermont to ask whether land use changes over time parallel with the, the declines in the species that we see. Um, we need more assessment of local threats, and by that I mean things like pesticide application um, and land use conversion. And finally, I think it's worth thinking about uh, whether uh, what's happening with the other 250 species of pollinating bees uh, that occur here. So this is just 18 species. There are lots of others that are not part of this survey. Uh, with that, I'll say thank you to a bunch of people and take any questions. It seems like the just the nature of the sampling would favor edge habitats. Yeah. Do you think you can extrapolate from that data to interior forest conditions? Um, yes and no. Uh, edge habitats are different than inter interior forest habitats. We do have some interior forest data, so we can compare those two things in, in the modern samples. Um, but but yes, edges have a lot more uh, a lot more flowering plants, uh, and you know, you know they're, they're different in many ways. So we could possibly expect different species of bees in those edge habitats than in adjacent forests. Any other? Are you still collecting historical records? <clears throat> uh, always, yes. Yeah, so I have more data than this now, but it's always coming in, and uh, collections continue to be digitized. And that's very valuable information. Do people photograph really well? Can you tell you the location, the chance location? Yes. Uh, so, so GPS location? So yeah, there are a number of citizen science projects that just rely on photos. One is called mobilewatch.org. Um, there's one. Uh, there's one in Maine that takes both photos and specimens. So if the photo is good enough, we, we can identify three quarters of those photos. Some of them you, you just need to see the bee and look at it with a microscope. But um, photo data is actually quite important in this uh, this respect. Yeah. So uh, for some of those relative abundance plots that you were showing earlier yeah. on, which were great graphics, by the way, it's a really effective communication. Are the different species in competition with each other? Is there an inherent RNA capacity, or how does that work? That's a great question. So uh, there's an inherent issue with relative abundance, because if one species is relatively more important in your collection, then others are, are by definition, going to be relatively less important. Right? So if I, so, so, and that doesn't imply ecological competition. It's competition within my data set. So that's a limitation of using relative abundance, but it's the best metric we have for evaluating these historic data sets where we don't have standardized collections through time. Um, but yes, there is competition. They're using the same resources. Uh, there's uh, scramble competition that we observe in the field. There's also competitive exclusion at times. Um, certainly there's competition from honeybees for certain floral resources, maybe some others. So that's something that I can't really tell you about with this type of data because for the most part we don't know what plants the bees were collected on in 1920 or 1930, uh, and we don't know what the you know the, the area was of sampled or the total abundance of bees in a sample in a sampling area. But it's that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, time for one more. One more. Yes. So, so I work with landowners and they're very interested in fascinated pollinators right now. They want to hear about pollinators, but they want to know what they can do. So where can we where are we taking this? What kind of I mean, yes, habitat loss and you know connectivity or but what other kinds of things? 
So I, I like to answer this question by saying there are small things you can do and big things that you also should do. And small things uh, like the, your personal choices about land management, even if by land we only mean your backyard. Uh, so minimizing use of pesticides, uh, herbicides and fungicides also can have negative consequences for bees. Um, sometimes planting native plants and also frankly non-native plants can help bees. Uh, probably not converting native types of habitats to, um, to suburban or, or higher levels of development. Uh, but then there are bigger things like, like, uh, like halting climate change. We know that climate change is affecting this taxon in particular. Bumblebees are, are uh, retreating from the south but not moving north as the, the world warms. And so um, big things like that are also important. And maybe you vote with your feet or your dollars in that sense. Yeah, I think we have to stop it. Yeah, I think we have to stop it. Maybe you guys can yeah. stop it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much.